is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. It is really good to know when someone has your back, isn't it? I mean, nobody wants to go into anything alone. Think of a soldier going into battle. Would a soldier going into battle want to go alone? Probably not. Uh, Do you want to be the lone voice uh, in a meeting or a board meeting? No, nobody wants to be the lone voice. It is always good to have somebody who will have your back. It is so good to have somebody who is going to encourage us because we all need encouragement. So uh, what I'm submitting to us today is is that we all need to have encouragers in our our lives, but also that, that I think God is calling us to be encouragers to others as well. I mean, we're we're continuing the series called Dealing with Messy Relationships. And the whole idea behind it is is for us to take some time and look at the relationships that we are in and try to figure out maybe how God is telling us that we can have even better ones than we have right now. And the especially difficult ones that we have, what can we do to improve these relationships? And last week, we talked about that we would be the people that are the first ones to step out in those relationships uh, and choose to bring God's love into the relationships that we have. Today, I want to talk about encouragement and what it would look like if we were the ones who proactively become the encouragers in the relationships that we have. Now, when you think of Paul the Apostle, those of us who who know a little bit of the Bible, when we think of Paul the Apostle, what we think of is this one guy who is just this tireless worker for Jesus, right? Always going around and and telling people uh, about Christ and, and inviting people to give their lives to him, doing these missionary journeys nonstop and and planting churches everywhere that he went and then writing letters to encourage. What I want to share with us today is before he was Paul the apostle, he was Saul the Pharisee and persecutor of the early church. And, and, and he experienced coming to know Christ on what's called, uh, the story is called the road to Damascus. And, and at that point, he starts l- learning to live, uh, for Jesus. But unbeknownst to him, you know, the, the church is continuing back in Jerusalem, trying to figure out how to share Christ with the people around them in Israel. And then Paul ends up making this journey to Jerusalem. And something ugly happens to him. Lord, as we begin to to pick up this story from here, would you help us to see the things that you want us to see today? God, that that we would imagine ourselves the recipient of what Saul or Paul experiences. And that we could see how, how what happens to him, God, may we be the type of people that will do the same for others in the body of Christ, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools. God, in our relationships that are just a little tough to deal with. That we would choose to hear these things and put them into place in our lives. Open our eyes to that, God, today. And may the words that I share and the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, for you are our rock and our blessed Redeemer. Amen. So Paul ends up back in Jerusalem where he is about to meet with the leaders of the early church. And that's where we pick up today. And in in, in chapter 9 of Acts, it says, When he came to Jerusalem... Uh, Saul, he, he, he tried to join the disciples, the people that were living for Jesus. He tries to join them, but they were very, they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a, a disciple. Well, why wouldn't they look at Paul, Saul and, and, and just decide that he is a disciple? I mean, he's saying that he is. 
Well, it's because of his history. I mean, what, what, what Paul, what, what, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep jumbling Saul and Paul because his name gets changed in a little bit. But what, what Saul was doing prior to him coming here, prior to the road to Damascus, was trying to capture Christians and, and throw them in prison so that they could be punished and persecuted, tortured, maybe even killed, so that they could end the movement of these people following Jesus. He was passionate about this. And everyone in the Christian movement was afraid of him because of that. And now this guy is showing up at church and saying, I'm all in at church. I I, I mean, wouldn't you be uncomfortable if that was happening? I am letting you know right now, I would be uncomfortable if that was happening. And and now he's he's trying to get them to believe that, that he really is a disciple following Jesus. Well, they would have nothing to do with him. And then as it goes on, it says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Now, who is this Barnabas guy? Right? If you were to look back in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, uh, we begin to see that Barnabas was actually this guy named Joseph. And Joseph is from Cyprus. And so then how in the world did, did Joseph end up with the name or the nickname Barnabas? Well, let's find out what Barnabas means. Barnabas, uh, Bar typically means son or son of, and so son of Nabus. And so then what is this Nabus? Well, the early definition of, of, of what this was is, is somebody who would preach or somebody who would prophesy things. And so, so possibly, quite possibly, uh, Barnabas, this Joseph guy, was the son of a preacher man, right? And, and, or, or he was somebody, uh, many people believe that he was somebody who actually was prophesying and preaching and sharing the good news news of Christ everywhere that he went. That, that what we know of Saul who becomes Saul, Paul, that, that Barnabas was a guy who was currently doing that uh, in the area of Jerusalem. And, but, but then a, a newer definition ends up coming of, of this word Nabus. And, and what that newer definition is, is encourager or encouragement. And, and so he is the son of encouragement. So maybe he's this guy that, that history has shared, uh, somebody who is going around and preaching and sharing Christ, and people trusted him to do that. But he also may be just this guy who is sharing encouragement in the lives of other people. And so this son of encouragement, this guy who has been living for Jesus, he brings Saul to the apostles. And look at what it says. He says, he told them how Saul, and I stop there because I want us to understand what I mean by told them. Because what it means is is to relate in full. Now how in the world could Barnabas relate in full what Saul had done or what happened to him. The only way he could relate in full was if he got to know Saul, if he was able to spend time with Saul, if he was able to see how Saul lived. And once he was able to do that, then he was able to stand up in front of somebody else and just let him know, I can tell you about Saul. Do you want to know why? Because I've spent some time with him. I've seen how he lives and how he acts and the things that he says. And this is what Barnabas now does with the leaders of the early church. And he tells them, he relates in full how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And, and so the, the, I, the, the story is, is that Saul was on the road to Damascus to continue persecuting Christians when Jesus all of a sudden stops him and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Isn't it hard for you to kick against me? And Saul experiences coming to know Christ. And it completely changes him. He's confused. He doesn't know what to do. Actually, he was even blinded at this moment until he goes and ends up meeting this guy named Ananias who, who, who God was speaking to and said, go and, and pray for this guy and start teaching this guy what it means to live for Christ. And he does. And Saul begins to learn this stuff. And everything that he learns, please hear this, everything that he learns, he starts to go out and do. It just becomes a part of his life. It becomes all that he is. And I, and I say hear that because we will begin to see that later in what's going on. 
And so he was on the journey, the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus, the place that he was heading to persecute people, instead what he had done is he had preached fearlessly the name of Jesus. There was a significant shift that took place, and Barnabas was either there or he talked with Paul, and he now knows these stories so completely that he's able to stand up in front of people and relate to them in full. I want to ask you a question. Do you know what this is? And gross bug is not the right answer. Just letting you know. Antlion, that is pretty impressive. Uh, an antlion. Now, an antlion is, is one of those bugs that, that they'll actually dig these holes in the ground. And, and then what they will do is, is they, will, they will position themselves in the bottom of that hole, uh, facing up. And the whole goal of it is, is to get the, this ant start crawling down in there is to catch them. It, it actually kind of reminds me of the sarlax, uh, uh, you know, that, that creature uh, in, re, in, what is it, Return of the Jedi? Um, which actually then plays back to Hayden Christensen in the video that we saw big earlier, but we don't need to get into all the Star Wars stuff, right? But, but the whole idea is, is that the ant lion would sit in the hole, and when, when ants start coming down in it, what they'll do is they'll shoot out sand and cause them to tumble down into it. They'll poison them, they'll kill them, and that's their food. Awesome, huh? Fits in with a message, doesn't it? What's this? This is called a lace wing. You know what a lace wing is? It's an adult antlion. How in the world, uh, my question then is, 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 is does an antlion turn into a lace wing? There is some sort of transformation that takes place so extraordinary that, that something that looks like an ugly bug turns into something that, well, in my opinion, would be a little less ugly of a bug. But, but, but another type of thing. And, and so then my question is, is how do you tell the difference between an antlion and a lacewing when they are exactly the same creature? How do you tell the difference? You look at them. You look at how they move. You look at what they eat. You look at where they live, and, and you will soon see that, that, that they are distinctly different, even though they're the exact same creature. And it reminds me that, that, that the transformation that takes place in somebody who gives their life to Christ is even more extraordinary than this, or at least it ought to be for the world to see. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone gives themselves to Jesus, right? That person is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. There is something distinctly different about the new creation in Christ compared to the old creation in Christ. How do we tell the difference? This is what Barnabas was getting to. We look at their, or they look at our lives. And how do we live? What do we do? How do we treat people? Because the followers of Jesus are to be so distinctly different in this world that people can tell we're different. Even though we are the same creature, so to speak, we're new. We're different. Barnabas took the time to see that in Saul. And he was convinced that Saul was different because he had met Christ. And so he's willing to stand up and stick his neck out for him. He's willing to be an encouragement for him and encourage the, the body of Christ in Jerusalem to welcome this guy. Let him come in. And these cautious, nervous leaders of the church, let it happen. Because Barnabas was willing to be an encouragement. An encouraged acceptance. And what it goes on to say, it says, so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in them. It literally means that Saul was able to move in and out and amongst everyone in the midst of the church, the early church. He, he all of a sudden gained access to everyone in their lives. What was going on? 
which I hope we're beginning to see some connections for us, the, the body of Christ here in Benton, right? I, I hope we begin to see that, that, that what, what, what was available to Saul is that he, they were, he was able to move in and amongst us and see what our lives are like and continue to learn and to grow and experience Christ from us and through us. Hopefully, hopefully the early church was a blessing to Saul, and hopefully we will be a blessing to other people through encouragement, inviting them in, accepting them, letting them see what it's like to be a follower of Jesus, figuring out how to live in this world. Because that's what they let Saul do. And it happened because of Barnabas and what he was willing to do. And so he continues to move in and out. And, and then what it says is that he says, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. It's in this time, the boldness, what it's talking about is in this time, he's beginning to discover how he can have a voice to clearly speak on behalf of Jesus everywhere that he goes. And it's because he was hanging around with the followers of Jesus. This is one of the reasons why we don't just encourage people to come to church on Sundays, but to get involved in a small group. It's so that we can wander in and out and amongst followers of Christ, and they can be an encouragement to us, and we can be an encouragement to them as they're trying to figure out how to live for Christ. And so what Barnabas did is he encouraged people to accept Paul, even though they weren't so sure about him. And they did. Now we're going to jump to chapter 11 here. And I just want to let you know that continued persecution was happening uh, in the church. Just prior to this, you know, we hear about Stephen being martyred for his faith. And, and what we see now in the next sections is, is uh, Peter gets this vision that, that, that the, the good news of Christ is supposed to go beyond the Jewish people and, and start being shared with the Gentiles. And, and people, as, as they're being scattered because of persecution, they're trying to avoid it. Everywhere that they went, because of all this in and out that was going on, on in the midst of the body of Christ. Everywhere that they went, they were confident in sharing Jesus where they ended up. And what we find out is, is that there's this area called Antioch, um, which is this huge city uh, north of Jerusalem, a couple hundred miles. And, and we find out that, that, that people are coming to know Christ there. And the people of, of the, the Jewish, the, the Jerusalem church, uh, they're trying to figure out what's going on, what's going on there. And is it really things of Jesus that are happening. So as we jump there, it says, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed, and they turned to the Lord. And the news of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And now they're going to try and figure out what's going on there. Now, why, why would they take the time to try and figure that out? I think it's because the message of Christ they wanted to make sure that it was shared in such a way that people understood about the transformation that happens in people's lives. Because I'm guessing many of us know this. There are a lot of churches out there. There are a lot of people out there who will encourage people to come to know Jesus, uh, you know, uh, ask Jesus into your heart. But, but we have often, especially in, in our culture today, we often sidestep this part about sin. And how the life that we were living is something that we have to let go of. The, the life where we're living for ourselves and, and, and not the way that God wants us to, we have to let go of that. And if we don't let go of that, then what we're doing, and if we're not telling people to let go of that, what we're doing that is we're giving people a false idea of what it means to live for Jesus. We live for Jesus just means saying yes here, and then I can just continue on doing whatever I want to do. And that is not the story of Christianity. That is not what giving your life to Christ means. And I'm guessing that the, the, the early church in Jerusalem are hearing that people are coming to know Jesus in Antioch, right? And, and they're, they're just saying, well, how do we know if it's really people genuinely giving their lives to Christ instead of just hearing about Jesus and continuing on with their life? And so what do they do? They send the son of a preacher man. <laughs> this guy who brings encouragement everywhere he goes. They send Barnabas to go find out. And so Barnabas goes to Antioch, and it says, And when he arrived, he saw that the grace of God, what the grace of God had done, that God truly was working in their lives. And he was glad 
And it says, and he encouraged them, which the word encourage here means to invite them, uh, to invite them into this new and different life, but encourage them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Now, now we know that encouragement means that he's inviting them, but, but to remain true means that this is where they are going to abide. This is where I, what I am going to adhere to. And so Barnabas is, is helping them to abide and adhere to Jesus. And the things of the Lord, but to do so with all their heart. And and, and the word for all of their here leading up to heart, this is the same word that was used to describe the the showbread uh, in in the temple. And the showbread was was in this place just outside the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was. And it was on this table where the the bread um, was there and there was 12 of them and and it was to symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel and that the presence of God was always on the 12 tribes of Israel. And the lampstand there is lighting it, so so it was the idea that the light of God was always, always on them. And now this is what Barnabas is inviting the people to in their lives, that every moment of their life, all that they have is to now be lived as they understand, as if I'm in the presence of God. But I don't think about that a whole lot, unless I'm reminded like the things of today. But Barnabas, he's encouraging us not to just say yes, but to say yes with all that we have and abide even to live in Christ and his presence. He encourages them where they are to grow. I I don't know if you know who this gentleman is. His name is Tommy DiPaola. And, and last year, March 30th, he passed away. Uh, but he is a the significant guy because he was this writer and an illustrator of over 270 children's stories. Uh, uh, he was so significant that there was this organization, and the organization is called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, that he became a part of. And, and he became a part of it because people saw in him somebody who would just encourage and encourage people wherever he went. People would ask him questions, uh, whether, whether it was online through the organization that he was doing or, or, or face-to-face, and he always preferred to do things face-to-face. Little kids would come up to him, and he would stop whatever he was doing just to encourage the kid and what he was doing, what they were doing. He was so significant that this society of children's book writers and illustrators actually didn't have and illustrators in their organization until Di Paola became a part of the organization. As a matter of fact, the, the governor of, of New Hampshire, he praised him and he said that, that, that Paola was a man who brought a smile to thousands of Granite State children who read his books, cherishing them for their brilliant illustrations. And whether or not you know it, the children's books, The Miracle of Jesus, Queen Esther, The Parables of Jesus, were all books that he wrote and illustrated. He just loved to invest in the lives of others, helping them to become all that they could. And it makes me think of what Barnabas was trying to do when he says that he was encouraging them to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Deep Aola was doing that in regards to his love for, for children and people choosing to be creative. God's calling us to do that with the good news of what Jesus, who Jesus Christ is and how that can change our lives. And so what Barnabas was doing is he was encouraging these people to grow. And then they, they, they give this, they describe who Barnabas is when they say he's this good man. And the word good here means that he has great interest in others. He was a man who cared about other people growing. And so he was this man who cared about other people growing, full of the Holy Spirit, filled up to the brim of, of, of the Holy Spirit and faith. And because of his encouragement, large number of people were brought to the Lord. You beginning to hear what our encouragement can do in the lives of other people? 
I hope so. And, and, and the, the numbers are growing so much that it's clearly beyond what Barnabas can handle here. And, and so as we move on, we see that, that he goes to Tarsus to try and find Saul. So Saul, he, he left Jerusalem and now he's back in his hometown, right? And so, so he, so Barnabas sees how important it is, um, to help these people learn how to grow, that he's willing to leave them and find somebody that he built, that he invested in and that, that he brought life to, to try and find him, to bring him back, to help them with what he was doing. And when he found him, he said, then he brought him to Antioch. And, and so for a whole year, which, which please help to understand what, what encouragement is. And encouragement isn't a one-time thing. Encouragement isn't saying something nice or writing a kind letter and we move on. Encouragement is an investment of our lives into the lives of other people. So for the whole year, Barnabas and Saul, they met with the church and they taught these great numbers of people just helping them to know what it means to live for Christ. And we know this because it says, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This is the first time the word Christian comes up in, in Scripture. And, and the word called here is the one that we have to grab onto here because I think we all understand Christ Christian means Christ one or a follower of Jesus. But the word called here, it literally means to be named after your business. What's your business? The business of the people who had given their lives to Christ in Antioch was to be a Christ one. And people started calling them that because that's what they saw in their lives. So Barnabas and Saul spends a year trying to encourage them how to live for Christ and, and then to just go and do it. And they do it and people see it. So much so that they call them Christians. And I hear this in, in the encouragement that, that they, they're, they're trying to invest into the lives of others. And I can't help but think about Hebrews 10.24, where we are challenged. The writer of Hebrews is, is challenging people. Let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. We can make a difference in the lives of the people around us. Through our words and our actions, we can be an encouragement. We can build life into one another. So it's the winter of 1990, 1991. And, and I'm, I'm this, this new Christian. I had given my life to Christ in June of, of, of that year, so it's a half year later. And, and I'm helping this church as they're, they're planting this church uh, near Minneapolis, Minnesota, in a town called Blaine. And, and while I was there and I'm doing, trying to do youth ministry, there's this gentleman named Tim. He's on the screen, although he was 30 years younger at the time. But there's a gentleman named Tim uh, who, was, who was discipling me. And he, he was, he was uh, meeting with me twice a week and just encouraging me in my faith, sitting down with me and trying to help me to understand what it means to live for Jesus and asking me, how's it going? And when I share the tough times, he would just smile at me and, and he would help me to, to ask God for forgiveness and so that we can start working once again to live fully for him. And it was stumble and, and, and conversations and forgiveness and moving on and this was continuing on. Well, I'm at a, I'm at a youth retreat, um, and, and Tim is with, uh, but there's, we brought youth from our church and a bunch of different churches, and we're at this retreat center in Iowa. And, and while that we were there, one of the leaders at the retreat asked me if I would be willing to give my testimony. It's like, sure, what's a testimony? And, and so they explained to me what a testimony was, uh, which simply, you know, if I could just give it in simple terms, before I met Jesus, what happened when I met Jesus, and what's my life been since I met Jesus, okay? And so just to give you a general idea, we're teaching a class right now how to tell your story. Um, and the idea is, is to help other people, help all of us learn to tell our story. It's going to be offered again um, in, in, a, in a couple of months, I believe. And so if you're somebody who does not necessarily know how to tell your story, I encourage all all of you to do so. As a matter of fact, the next series that I'm doing is, is how to share Jesus, just to help us all to figure out how we can share our faith, what God has done in our lives, how, how we can show that, how we can be the newsfeed of Christ is what I'm imagining is to the world around us. 
And so I said, yes, that, that I will share my testimony. And so we're one of the evenings, and all the kids are gathered, and, and by kids I mean teenagers, all the teenagers are gathered, and I start to share my story. And I, and I share about all the ugliness that I had, that, that it was a part of my life, and the things that I was doing before I met Christ. And, and then I shared what happened when I met Christ, and when, when I was on my knees with this one guy, and we were praying to, that I would say, you know, that, that Lord, forgive me for my sin. I give my life to you. And, and, then, and then since I met Christ, it was basically, and now I'm here. It hasn't been that long since this has happened. And when I was done, a group of the leaders who were in charge of the retreat, I found out were very, very concerned about the things that I shared because they thought that I had glorified my life before I met Christ. And, and at the time, I probably did, because I didn't necessarily understand what was the way to focus on it. And they thought, they thought you, you talked so much about the things that you did when you, when you weren't following Christ, that, that they literally came up to me and they told me, they said, oh, we don't think you should be around the youth anymore on the retreat, and, and we don't want you to come back. And, and I'm not trying to beat them up, right? Because I was this new Christian, and I'm, and I'm talking about all the, all the stuff that I was doing that, that, that didn't bring honor and glory to God. And, and, yet, and Jesus changed my life, and here I am now. And, and, and so I get it. I was focusing so much on this stuff, but at the time, I was crushed. I was heartbroken. And who do they think they are to tell me that I can't share the story that God had given me? And honestly, I was done. And if it wasn't for Tim sitting down with me, looking me in the eyes and saying, they don't know what I see in you. And that you truly do love Jesus. You're just learning, out, learning how. And he said, if they don't invite you back, we won't come back either but I'm going to continue to help you to live all that you can for Christ. I don't know if I would be where I am today if it wasn't for Tim. I don't know if I would be continuing to live for Christ if it wasn't for Tim. And the encouragement that he gave me in a time where I so desperately needed it. But it wasn't just the words that Tim said to me that night. It was him being with me, leading up to that night, showing me how to live for Christ, encouraging me as I stumbled, and how he continued to do those things afterwards and stood by my side. That's encouragement. And, and I think that I owe much of my Christian walk to this man who was willing to encourage me I was trying to figure out what it meant to live for Jesus. Now, imagine that you and I would do that in the lives of one another. Boy, what would the body of Christ look like here? And imagine if we would show that type of encouragement in our relationships, inside the church, outside the church. What would they see in us? I'm guessing they'd see much more of a lace wing than an antlion. So I invite you today just to take some time and think about somebody, one person that you could encourage. Whom do you know that could really use some encouraging words from you? right now. Who is it? I'm hoping that a name has already come to mind for you. Who's the person? And what could you tell them? Maybe even today, what could you tell them to make a difference in their day or in their lives? Lord, as we begin to look at a person to encourage, would your spirit please be speaking to us so that we uh, will definitely have a name that we can share 
encouragement with. And God, may we be the people, all of us who are hearing this today, may we be the people that step into a life of encouragement. And Lord, as only you can do, will you move these relationships closer to ones that bring you honor and glory because we, the followers of Christ, are living into the life of encouragement that you call us to. Thank you, God. We walk forward boldly. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebittenchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And He loves you.